Okay, so let me summarize the questions, uh, and then I will turn to the panel. Um, and panel, you can pick up on what you can, and if we can't answer properly, we'll, we'll talk uh, to people separately over coffee. Um, uh, so uh, I think it was Osman had the, the issue about, uh, you know, you've got companies competing uh, in a sector and the politics around that. Uh, we had Jeremy had a question for uh, Tony Orbin about the elites versus communities, who's going to capture the benefits. Uh, Jorgen had a question on uh, tax incentives, tax holidays, good idea, bad idea. Uh, the lady from Raw Talks, very welcome, uh, had, a, had a question for Evelyn on automation. Uh, the implications for local content, also on climate change. Uh, the gentleman Albert from, Kundo, uh, from Rapoa had a question about artisanal and small-scale mining as a source of um, employment, and that's probably a question for Tony. Uh, Sam Jones from our Mozambique team had a really tough one about, uh, give us an example of uh, uh, developing good quality institutions from a pretty low institutional base. Um, Nigel from the South African government had a question about local content and uh, regional initiatives. Uh, our colleague from Mozambique had a question about natural gas uh, revenues. Are they high or low in different countries? And the natural resource curse. Uh, Peter Corti from Ghana, where is the environmental challenge? Where is the corruption issue? And finally, Lida Swan from uh, Vietnam uh, said environment, green mining, uh, what do you think of EITI, et cetera? Okay, so uh, five minutes. Okay, can I start? Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, Tony, Tony, you look a brave man to answer these questions. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I might combine some of them, particularly the area of illegal mining and artisanal small-scale mining. I think the terminology is more about uh, artisanal small-scale mining. People have issues with illegal and legal and things like that. But I agree with you. Um, it's, it's a very critical uh, area in, uh, in, in, in the whole uh, story of mining, and this is an area that needs to be looked at. I mean, combined with the question on uh, whether there could be a relationship with the large-scale miners. In fact, I've done, a f I've done some work in that area. I did um, an article on Live and Let's Live, and Let's Live. the title was Live and Let's Live, how small-scale mining could live with large-scale mining. But again, it, it, it had long been perceived as an, as, as an illegal activity. In Ghana, it was not until 1989 that a law was passed to allow small-scale mining to exist. Uh, so I think gradually, there is an effort to formalize in some jurisdiction. I, yeah, we just completed a, a, a toolkit. I, I was working with the UNITA to develop a toolkit for formalizing small-scale mining. And it's something that we want to use to encourage that because in the past, uh, mining was looked at as a source of just taxation, employment, and not as a developmental uh, thing. And I, I believe this is one of the object of uh, the book, just to make mining a tool for development. And uh, my good friend, Jeremy, Jeremy and I used to be in the same uh, uh, institute. So uh, I know he has hard questions always. Now, first of all, the, the, for every or for most economic activities, there's some level of appropriation of the environment. There's always some level of appropriation of, of the environment. So that is given. Now, in Ghana, um, we have a system of trying to accommodate these appropriations, the impact. Um, before you start mining, there's a requirement for you to undertake uh, environmental impact assessment, which the EPA uh, uh, supervises. And then after that, you have to come up with environmental management plan. And you pay for it. It is a kind of polluter, polluter pays thing. So um, the, the government recognizes that, and there's regulation around that. Now, as I was indicated earlier, companies have become a bit more enlightened than before. So these days, companies do not want to pollute first before trying to, to, to talk to the, 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 the community. So I think there's a, a growing harmony um, between companies and communities. When I started mining, some, uh, working in the mines, not mining myself, um, not, not a week went by without a clash between a company and a community. Now you hardly find that. So I believe there's a, a mm -hmm. bit of a, yep. uh, some stability there. Mm -hmm. So this is my comment. these mm -hmm. are my comments. Okay. Could, could I ask Catherine to join in at this point about, because uh, I know you're an expert on the gas industry. I know you can't answer the detailed question about sort of, High and low, but uh, 
but you also might want to respond some, to some of the other issues. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Let me pick up first on the environmental issues, because I think there was a comment here on how a company is responding on the climate change agenda. And I mean, what's very interesting is that there's a number of initiatives now. For example, Mark Carney, the Financial Stability Board, set up the um, Bloomberg Commission, which then came out with how companies disclose their climate risks. So companies now, they, this is a voluntary disclosure system. It's not mandatory, but there's a very large number of institutional investors now who are requiring big companies, particularly in the extractive industries, for example, to report. All companies have done internal assessments on climate risks. Most of them have a carbon price, you know, which they factor in. But these typically haven't been shared publicly before. So this is now a process to get companies to disclose what are the material risks, because there's a lot of divestment campaigns, which I'm sure you're familiar. But I mean, on the, on the sort of broader environmental issues, and a number of people picked up on, on how a company is dealing with it. Well, there are the, the international standards, which is the IFC, and that's generally well recognized, but they tend to be a bit more on the side of the do no harm rather than on, you know, the opportunities around this. So there's been some quite interesting examples in Asia, for example. So Thailand has a very active citizen and NGO community, which is monitoring a lot of the coal developments, potential coal developments or existing coal. And they've been very active in actually getting their issues in front of governments and the media. And, and, but there's also this, a, a uh, NGO in the Philippines, which is monitoring air quality in cities in Asia. 99% of all cities in Asia are polluted way above the WHO guidelines. But this is putting pressure on governments such as China. The, the big push in China to reduce their energy mix from coal has come about to some degree because of the citizen action around the really bad air pollution in major cities. So citizen action you know, can actually be deployed quite effectively to help governments to start to address these challenges. On the gas, Tony, I mean, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but Wood Mackenzie certainly does, it does they do broad analysis of all uh, countries, what the tax regimes are, what is the take between the company and the government. And there's a very wide variety. You've got some countries where it's a sort of 95% all the way down to, so I mean, there re mm. really is a broad mm. variation, but mm. Wood Mackenzie is the best source mm. of the data yeah. on gas. And actually this illustrates the importance of sharing of, of tax uh, information as, as much as possible. Uh, across governments and uh, uh, also with, with uh, the public. Uh, Evelyn, can I, I turn to you uh, on, on some of the questions around um, automation and, and local content? We're running out of time, so just uh, sort of be selective. Thanks also for that question. I guess there's two sorts of ways we can take, you can take that question. Uh, microphone. Automation, microphone. microphone. Automation on the mining industry. One is sort of related to what uh, Joseph Stiglitz was saying this morning, the sort of reduction of wage, the component that of what companies would spend and an increase on the side of capital, which I suppose would sort of mean that people in Germany get more jobs, but not necessarily in South Africa where local content or local employment would otherwise be generated. I think uh, uh, another part, issue behind that focus on the lessening of opportunities for local content is that the local content debate has very narrowly focused on supplier development. That is companies that supply into the industry, often with a focus on actually the sort of manufacturing, like fabrication yards and things like that. I think it might be useful to distinguish there between whether you want to really develop suppliers that supply only into the industry and then become very dependent on the industry, or whether you focus on the sorts of goods and services that are transferable across various sectors where it makes sense to look for a broader demand, but the sector also needs that, so that, that the learning to produce those and provide those sorts of goods and services can piggyback on that there is demand from the sector, but there is demand also beyond that. So I think that sort of distinction between very narrowly focusing attention to its supplier development versus what is needed for a sort of more general, broader enterprise development 
is, 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 is part of that question. There was also the question about good institutions not being a precondition. That's not what we're saying. We're saying it is not enough to say that good institutions are what is needed, and they're certainly not sufficient because it's very difficult to say what good institutions are, and it's very context-specific. If you look at a lot of the economic literature, particularly that that uses institutions as a variable, as an input factor, and then looks for a proxy to use that in quantitative analysis, tries to pin it on something very specific, such as have you had a, a stabilization fund or something like that. You look at the example of Chile, that may well be what saved them and was very important for them. But for other countries, it may be something very different in terms of what positive institutional change may be. The Ghanaian example of six authorities responsible for the same thing, fighting over what is really in place, or regulation where it's unclear who actually carries the responsibility to then be accountable for what they're doing. That's the sort of thing that where it goes a lot deeper than focusing on this very superficial, what we need is good institutions, and then really just kind of picking mm -hmm. this and picking that because it makes it easy to advise, mm. but really the, the difficult things we're not willing to look at. Mm. That's really my point. I'm not mm. saying that, that institutions are not important. They are very important, but let's please not mm. use a very superficial definition of what good institutions are. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, Andres, do you have any sort of final reflections? I mean, Chile, in some ways, is very well placed uh, on the environmental area, on the potential of lithium for the renewables revolution. It's not just a story, is it? Of, um, you've been very successful on the macro side, but uh, look, things, this, things must look quite good. Well, yeah, I, I would say... Um well, in lithium, the, the thing, I mean, there has been some controversy in Chile in the sense that uh, on how to exploit, uh, Chile has one of the largest uh, lithium deposits in, in the world, so it's, there's a big potential there. Uh, for what I see is, uh, but basically it, it is being uh, exploited by two, two companies. Uh, one one is, uh, is a national privatized company. Uh, and the other is a, is, is a foreign corporation. Well, I think the, the, the problem is how to increase the degree of uh, value added in the extraction of lithium. I mean, mm -hmm. how, one of the problems in our, in our export structure is that copper has a relatively uh, low or intermediate re degree of uh, value added and elaboration, and, mm -hmm. and how to avoid this feature in the lithium sector, mm. I think, is, is yeah. an important issue. And the other is level of royalties. I mean, since yeah. it's run by the private yeah. sector, to what extent the public sector can share mm. some of the, the public sector yeah. as, a, as a representative mm. of society as a whole, ideally, uh, how can I get a higher share of, of, of mm. income? I think that's... Mm. Uh, but lithium it's, is a very prom promising uh, uh, sector. That, that's very important. In fact, it actually goes to uh, Peter's point about, uh, you know, resource curse and uh, also, uh, you know, so, several countries probably are, what they have ahead of them is a resource curse coming from the demand of renewables, electric vehicles and so on for, for cobalt and lithium. I mean, DRC in some ways is already entering this scenario. Um, finally, because we really are running out of time, we need some coffee. Um, Alan, uh, some final reflections? I think most of the questions have been answered. I, 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 I'm very, um, um, no, I'm noting that your question has not been answered because it's very difficult to answer. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, think, I think you're stressing our taxonomy to the point of uh, it breaking. I, I recognize the uh, example you gave. I can come up with many similar examples of this sort of slightly arbitrary government intervention. Whether that deviates from the proposition that a, a particular government, you know, I, I use the example of Ghana and Tanzania, are generally you know, relatively effective. It's a relative term. It's not an absolute term. Um, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't dis, I wouldn't change that statement, but that doesn't mean that I, I don't under, I do not understand that there are cases in those countries and similar countries where we get this arbitrary intervention, which uh, would, would cause difficulty. So I'm not really answering the question. It's a, it's a very good question. Come and work with us and fine tune that taxonomy to make it more effective. I think the what I'd like to comment on is just briefly again the inst point on institutions. Um, Evans already answered Samuel's point that uh, we weren't in any, any sense saying that um, good institutions can be sort of predetermined. We, we in, indeed, you know, a lot of the work that donor agencies have done uh, have been to sort of play around with it. I, I worked in the Soviet Union for the World Bank and I saw how easy it was to get a new law passed in, in Ukraine. Extra extraordinary. It took me, as someone who knows nothing about law, to get a, about two weeks to persuade someone to pass a new law on something. 
in, it meant absolutely nothing. That's the formality of law. You know, the, the institutions that matter, the ones that are sort of embedded in the will and customs of people and are sort of acceptable to people, the sort of comments that we had in the, the early lecture of, um, um, on, on, on day one. Um, I think the points about local content, I, I would really like to argue they, they should be much more embodied in, in, embedded rather in this transformation process. I think you know, what we see very commonly in Africa is a sort of view about local content that says the mandated targets. You know, by a certain date, company X must be buying 15% of its, its, uh, its procured goods and services from the, the local economy. Uh, this doesn't work. It's a form of protectionism. Uh, 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 you know, when the industry no longer exists, that um, that activity of supplying that 15% or whatever it is is no longer viable. I mean, I think it's it's much better, and this is argued more carefully in the chapter by Ole Ostensen, to look at the systemic reasons why companies are not able uh, to supply, why the capacity is so low in countries like Mozambique. You know, look at the 101 reasons why SME businesses in the in the regions where the extractive companies are operating, are not able to expand to meet an obviously increased demand for whatever it may be. And, and I, so I think that feeds into the more general policy about uh, governments, in, when talking about extractors, formulating a long-term industrial strategy in, in which they see the opportunities from the demand linking to a lot of expenditures which would previously not be there without the extractor. And I think, above all here, we have to think about the expenditure which is indirect. When we talk about local content, we think about the mining companies buying from local suppliers. We think about the incomes that are created from mining companies, and then the, the second round effects, the multipliers, if you like, you'll get probably a multiplier of four, five, six times of expenditure compared with what the mining companies themselves spend. You want that expenditure to be able to um, meet a supply from local small businesses, either the ones that already exist or the ones that can be created. And that requires generalized government policy and not very specific policies which have the local content label. Very important.